believe that the nature of the law should ultimately reflect what the people believe to be just, and that any other form of law is inherently unjust. But more than that, we think that OG is rather uncomparative and rather assertive when it implied that the constitutional frameworks, frameworks, frameworks were necessarily more progressive than other ones. Um, three, two, three issues my speech. Firstly, let's address the bulk of OG's material. Secondly, why principle is an unjust form of law. Thirdly, why alternatives to change the laws, presumably via legislation, is incredibly problematic. But before that, let's just do some setup work. First, what does OO stand for? We stand for alternate forms of constitutional interpretation, typically the forms that involve um, identifying the intent of those frameworks and seeing the constitution as a living, breathing document that adheres to the moral frameworks of the times. What are we against? We are against this literalist interpretation that look at precedents of the past and use the same definitions, definitions that the people used in that past. So this looks like, for example, the gay, ma uh, gay, ma gay, uh, sorry, gay marriage, the term gay marriage, interpreting marriage as between a man and a woman, is a presumably point we also oppose as well. Firstly, let's talk about OG for a second. I think they just gave a bunch of impacts as to why minorities are better off without analyzing the reasons why the constitutional framers define minorities or define laws in such a way that help them to begin with. I think the intuitive response here is that empirically and too intuitively, the moral arc of society and history has only gone better over time as opposed to not. This means, for example, if you want years ago, we think that the moral frameworks of society were rather problematic. This means, for example, that the US constitutional frameworks who were slave owners interpreted freedom and liberties as freedom and liberties for a white man. They interpreted the right to vote as a right to vote subject to being a man as well. Note that the vast majority of their minority arguments have to be substantiated with a reason why, for example, the current legislation it will, not, will not cater to these people and why those people were better. We do not hear any of these reasons. No, thank you. Second, let's talk about why this is principally an unjust form of things. So our stance is very simple, right? It's that laws should ultimately reflect what the people believe to be true and what the people believe to be just. For example, I think that 200 years ago, there the, the reason why there's a right to bear in arms in the US constitutional framework was ultimately because the society and the situation that people were likely to, to go through necessitated those laws. This means, for example, there were situations such as like the Wild Wild West, with priests, right? there was violence literally everywhere. Point. We were content that things have changed here in terms of the societal dogmas and societal frameworks that people currently adhere to. The reason Point. why gay marriage was perceived to be between a man and a woman was precisely because of the overarching variance of Christianity in those places. It was catered to a different framework of society, and we don't think there's inherent value as to why we should adhere to these frameworks at all. But secondly, we also think that, very crucially, we think laws are just principally only legitimate, only if they've gone through a due process that involves the sayings and the, uh, and the grievances of the citizens. <coughs> Firstly, let's identify the role of judges when it comes to the point of law. We will say that they're the sole interpreter of the law, and then the legislative branch of the government sort of just interprets, sort of just uses that legislation after the judge post facto has already interpreted that law. We would say that if the average citizen is unable to mold this law to his liking, because now judges have arbitrarily subscribed to the moral frameworks of someone who was like 200 years ago, you have no ability to influence that sole interpreter. This means that you have no ability to change those laws either. Why is this important? Because ultimately, within the states, the state's coercive mechanism of putting people into jails and, and instituting laws limiting your autonomy is only justified if people are able to change what mechanisms that limit the autonomy. And so far as they're not able to do so, that is an unjust state to live under. So, second point. Let's talk about why alternatives to change laws via legislation is problematic. Because all smart people are smart. I mean, all realizes that the clear comparative here then is why you can't constitutionally amend these laws and like presumably a bunch of reasons, good reasons why that's the case. We would contend with four reasons. First, notice that political systems often are sold out to power lobbies in so far as these people end up being the ones in parliament who debate these laws and amend these laws. We don't see a reason why Bernie Sanders, for example, even, who's funded by the NRA, votes in favor of gun laws. Comparatively, judges don't need to be elected, don't need the amount of campaign finance to last in politics, and presumably they are incentives for more like the white people. For example, Supreme Court justices are appointed for life. They have no incentive to cater to the whims of these like, large lobbying groups. But second, we also contend that the sheer process of legislative change is incredibly difficult and incredibly problematic. It slows legislation down. And there are two simple structural reasons for this. Firstly, that often it involves the intermixing of party politics. The Republicans have an incentive to always stifle what Democrats want, even though it could be a legitimate cost to take, they simply have an incentive to do so insofar as the credit still goes to Democrats. Secondly, that it was also things such as like uh, filibustery, where people just would rather stand in parliament for like 40 hours or something to just simply so the Democrats don't get their, 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 their legislation passed. In those instances, you make law incredibly slow, and I'll, uh, I'll impact that later in terms of the implications for, the, uh, for, for laws. Thirdly, you also note that politicians and 
A positive empowerment should have a net incentive to pander to the people in terms of the short-term incentives that people subscribe to. It means that there are incentives and interests often shift based on the tide and bearings of people. For example, no, thank you, sir. this means that you're likely, as, as we see, the Supreme Court is likely to ban Muslims purely because the people wanted them to do so. At the very least, under outside of the house, and if you if you are able to interpret it in a like in a more clear meaning where you take all things into consideration, you're more likely to interpret it in a more progressive manner. But for me, I also contend that in terms of the legacy that each judge wants to contend, no judge wants to be on the wrong side of history. They're more likely to be progressive in that way. Politicians, by nature of the fact that no politician is like responsible for the law that they pass, precisely because it's diluted in fashion. It means all body politicians are more are responsible for a particular law, whereas a judge is solely responsible for changing out of history. He's more likely to be progressive on the dead side and on the outside of the house. Uh, I'll take you have conclusion. You said that the law should represent the people, but Trump has already established a conservative majority of young conservative judges then. So in the case the US was voting a liberal right. government, and right. if there's a conservative interpretation, why then is that Democrat? Right, so the difference, it's a bit comparative, right? Because then it's like Trump versus some dude from 200 years ago who is probably more conservative and probably worse. Under our side, at least you have the possibility of changing the law, those laws, precisely because you don't adhere to the tourist interpretation in that sense. In fact, why is this incredibly important? Because we rely on a sole interpreted, interpreted, interpreted to be more progressive. Why is this incredibly better? Firstly, we think it's incredibly easier to counter the fact that the NRA currently lobbies against those uh, lobbies against progressive change. Because under under the outside of the house, what's likely to happen is that these laws become incredibly rigid, and judges interpret like pro gun laws to mean like a fundamental right to bear arms, as opposed to under the outside of the house, where judges could interpret it more flexibly and realize that society might not necessarily need those laws anymore. Now, secondly, if you buy that legislation is likely to be prolonged and slowed down, what does this mean? We think that there are a vast majority of things that are very time sensitive and urgent to adhere to. Things such as abortion every day. Baby, uh, no, like women don't get the right to choose. Um, like Muslims are deported back to like countries in, in, in like Africa, and Middle East, and things like that. And we think that every day is like a, a trade-off that we're not that we're not willing to do either. Ultimately, they have to adhere to a rigid, not only rigid but probably unprogressive form of progress. Very proud. Chair. The difference between the open government and the open opposition in this debate is that ours is a side that acknowledges the fact that democracy is important. That laws that are passed once upon a time don't necessarily reflect the fairest way in which the lives of people ought to be regulated. And therefore, we are very willing to make sure that instead of blindly, like blindly following the original interpretation of that law, we would like to make it more likely that the fairest law is put into place. And that's why we think that judicial activism, which is ultimately what this debate is about, which is taking the fairest interpretation of the, of the law, wherever there is some vagueness that allows for that, is the better way than to press that in the hands of politicians whose incentives are ultimately dubious and not trustworthy. Cannot be trusted, right? I'll talk about a few things in this speech. First of all, I want to tell you why original law, why the law, the original interpretation of the law isn't fair. I will then tell you why comparative to legislation, uh, judici ju ju judiciary interpret interpreting laws uh, through this means is, is going to lead to better consequences. And I want to finally touch upon uh, a couple of things about on which side is there more respect for the law uh, and stuff like that. So first of all, why is the law as it was made not necessarily fair, not necessarily applicable to these times? We think first of all it's very obvious that the views of the people at that time with regards to women, with regards to sexual minorities, etc. Point. were fairly regressive, right? So people obviously didn't see that uh, like a marriage between a man and a man could be conceivable and therefore they didn't think of that at the point when they made that law. But then that is not reason for us to stick to that law to this day. We think secondly there were specific scenarios that necess necessitated those kinds of laws. So for example, uh, because the state was still like quite quite nascent, there was a 
fear of government tyranny, which is not as, as relevant to this day, uh, the right to bear arms was made uh, was made fundamental to the constitution at that time. We don't see why we need to stick to that interpretation to, to this day. If that law is still relevant, we think the judges can consider that. But if, if it's not blindly agreeing to what people decide at that point, it's not okay. So we think these laws ought to be changed. What is the fairest way for the to, to change them then, right? So we said that judges were better, uh, better actors in this regard. We gave a few reasons for that. Uh, before that, I want to address the problems with judges that I want to talk about. Right? The first thing that we heard, that judges are not representative, right? that uh, these are male, white male people, etc. and they dominate the court. First of all, like, I, I just don't think that that's necessarily true in places like the United States, where we have quite a few like, female, strong female judges and African American people, etc. on that bench. We don't think necessarily it's the case that it's only people from a specific class. But even if that was the case, Madam Speaker, it's not clear why people who come from different class cannot have correct views with regards to how to treat different people, right? We think for a number of reasons. Sit down. First of all, Madam Speaker, we think these people have been educated, have gone through a history of cases and the effects that those cases have had on a number of people. We think that kind of deliberation and constant deliberation and education, uh, especially in the United States where I think the liberal trend is quite heavy when, when, when it comes to the uh, like education of uh, like lawmakers, we think it's not clear why those people are going to uh, like, interpret the Constitution in self-enriching ways. We think secondly, Madam Speaker, uh, their problem was that the judge is appointed once and then uh, he's gonna stick to his biases over time, right? It's funny, Madam Speaker, that they have a problem with a judge like who was appointed 20 years later, interpreting laws in his 20-year-old mindset, but they stand for this, uh, they are the side that also stands for interpreting the laws uh, as it was written 200 years ago. But more importantly, we think judges also change their views over time in response to how the media receives their discussion, decisions, what the effects of those decisions uh, over time turn out to be, and also how they uh, also from discussions with their colleagues. It's not clear, Madam Speaker, why that. Like, like their views are necessarily that static, right? We think thirdly, man, uh, th there are a few more reasons. Uh, the, the third problem that they had was that partisan presidents are gonna, like Donald Trump, for example, is gonna appoint a conservative judge, and that's a problem, right? Madam Speaker, we think that may be true, but we think like uh, that's a problem on that side as well, because Donald Trump is still gonna appoint a president. And what exactly is the original interpretation of the Constitution is again up for some kind of debate, right? Like what exactly did people of that time think? Did they actually believe that a married previous man and man was like a, 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 by marriage they actually mean man for married previous man and man? And at the point when the presidents are going to appoint corrupt judges, we don't think it's necessarily clear that they're not gonna do uh, the, the people whose originalist interpretation aligns with their own, right? Ultimately, those people, can, the, those judges can also give their own account of what they believe that original theory means. Why do we then believe that the judges are better actors for a number of reasons? We told you, Madam Speaker, that unlike uh, legislation, these people are not as affected by the lobbies. Etc. Right? Because they don't need to be re-elected. So yes, they may have certain biases and they may have done some certain things to appease certain actors when they entered, when when they were becoming a judge. Their views, they are free to revise their views, etc. Without any fear of like having campaign donations to be re-elected. We think that's a positive, like all the, that that's a positive influence compared to what the lawmakers have. Secondly, it, it's an immediate decision that can provide immediate relief to a number of people, Madam Speaker. Right? On things like the gay marriage, we can't trust our politicians to take. 30 more years to deprive gay people of their most fundamental rights, whether it's Supreme Court can do that now. We think that's a, 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 again a significant difference because that side stands for like several more decades of the perpetuation of those kinds of double standards. We think thirdly, like judges have short term, have long term incentives with regards to their legacy where politicians are more susceptible to things like populism where they care about how they want to be elected. Closing. Who wins when a liberal Supreme Court can allow for things like gay marriage, but a conservative Supreme Court years later is going to start banning foreigners from coming into the country? I mean, I don't know, but I don't know why your side is like any better, right? Because your side is still going to have those okay. kinds of people making laws which are incredibly hard to change compared to the appointed trends and like internal reasons why judges are more likely to lead to better consequences. There's one more very important reason. Judges have to intellectually justify their decisions. And this is very important, right? As opposed to just saying that I believe that uh, the, this is what people at that time felt, you have to say why. Uh, like it is more fair to restrict marriage between a man and a man, or it is more fair to allow people to bear arms with countless number of people across the United States are dying from that. That intellectual justification constrains them, Mr. Speaker, from extremely radical stances. All of those are decisions that make them better suited and more fair actors for this reasons. Madam Speaker, secondly, I just feel that it is a, like in in the world in which judges cannot do this, the likely like 
counterfactual is that politicians are going to very aggressively start changing those laws, right? And we think that's bad because that renders the constitution significantly weaker because the respect for the constitution and the fundamental uh, things that are guaranteed in the constitution is is quite diluted. So in countries like Brazil, where people can change what the fundamental liberties that are guaranteed to people uh, like actually mean, that reduces the respect that people have for those laws in the constitution. We think that leads ultimately to like an unstable country for those reasons very proud to oppose. We appreciate OG's framing. They talked about an objective reference point and how you take away the biases of judges. Owo said that alternatives are worse. But note here that they did not understand what they stand for. Because a line and deputy leader of opposition said they wanted to stand for legal precedents and educated lawmakers. We stand for that. There's a reason why people go to Harvard Law School and Yale Law School and study for eight years to master the law. So it allows us to assume that there can be an objective interpretation of the law. On your side, I like that framing of judicial activism. Because your side says that you can have social justice warriors come in and impose their own biases on how the law works. We think that is comparatively worse. I'm going to do three things in this speech. First of all, I'm going to extend on the principle of law and why that is illegitimate. Secondly, I'm going to uh, talk about the alternatives and, and, and fill in the lack of mechanism given to us by OG. And finally, I'm going to bring in reputation there. Uh, all our level will be integrated. First, on the principle of law. We can see and we agree with the principle that the law should serve the people. But the question is, the means through which the law exists and how it serves the people. We think that a law exists because you need to have an objective interpretation of that law to provide a check against illegitimate policies and that it is rigid and unable to change so you always refer back to that election point. Note that this is more illegitimate because people have not consented to the individuals in the Supreme Court to have this right to determine the livelihoods of their lives and the decisions that make up a huge part of their lives. There are two reasons as to why this is true. The first reason why is because it's undemocratic, which OG uh, really missed, because these are life terms. So the Roberts Court, for example, has people like Neil Gorsuch, who's just a young conservative appointed by Donald Trump, who will probably shape conservative jurisprudence for years to come, and also conservative majorities appointed by Reagan. So they don't want to talk about accountability to the people. I don't think that happens on their side when you're always allowed to use your own biases, whether or not people decide a liberal, uh, a liberal jurisprudence is important or conservative jurisprudence. But finally, this principle is not is also justified because on their side there's egregious forms of harm. Because conservative judges as well are able to reverse the law in a way that is completely egregious. You're able to do things like set precedents that make the laws even more the constitution, which they conceive is conservative, even more conservative than it originally was. Like in the Muslim ban, like in labor unions, and also through things like gay rights as well. So if they want to talk about accountability, it's far worse on their side. So under this simple principle, we think that law is there as an objective reference point not one for social justice warriors to interpret. No, thank you. Secondly, on alternatives as comparative. OG didn't really give a met as to why they were better, so I'm going to provide a comparative here now. First of all, I'm going to respond to all the structural reasons they gave on O as to why alternatives and the ideas of legislation are bad. The first thing that they told us was that, the, that uh, law legislation legislatures are bad because of lobbied by corporations. Two responses here. First, corporate lobbies are symmetric to both judges and legislatures as well, because there are corporate lobbies to judges that affect them. But even if you don't buy that, there are still lobbies to presidents that appoint them as well. So they'll lobby Trump to appoint people like Neil Gorsuch, so they're still accountable there as well. But secondly, even if we do have corporate lobbies, look at the comparative. We have changed. So if you don't appreciate what corporate lobbies have produced, every six years you can just elect in a new senator, or every two years you can elect in a different congressman as well. So it's comparatively better and it's more accountable. Secondly, they talked about filibustering. We, we can see that this is a problem. It's slow, but we are better. Because they didn't analyze the comparative of how the Supreme Court works. Because the Supreme Court is incredibly slow in its way to make decisions. You have to choose cases to, in a way that suits you and it suits the biases of judges. And secondly, it has to be elevated from the state to then the regions and then all the way referred to the Supreme Court. That'll take like three years, but it's comparatively better. Where even if you have legislation, all you need to do is table a bill and have a vote on it. So filibustering might occur, but it's comparatively faster than all the structural reasons there. But more importantly,
economy. Look at the structural incentives behind legislatures and parliamentarians facing election as well. Because they care about re-election. And they're not going to do some stupid policy that's literally not accountable and that's going to vote them out for it as well. Why then are we better? And here is where I want to talk about different mechanisms of change that we can prefer that are comparably better on their side of the house. First of all, we solve this through constitutional amendments. Don't let them get away by saying we're going to defend the originalist document that was literally created by the founding fathers, because we do concede that's outdated. The original constitution was bad, and they were like patriarchal, but we have things like the Equality Amendment that enfranchised women, and prohibition that allowed alcohols despite being in a conservative time. Their response might be that constitutional amendments are rare in the status quo. But the reason why constitutional amendments are rare is precisely because of their side. Why is this the case? Because when you have a judicial interpretation, that becomes the primary means through which judges implement their modern views. So when, for example, they rule on gay marriage, they say it's constitutional, they say, I've done all I can to rule on modernity, we don't need a constitutional amendment for this because we already have a precedent. So they have less political capital to get those amendments in the first place. Why then are permanent constitutional amendments better? No, thank you, sir. It's because permanent amendments allow people and stay in permanence because people cannot go with their subjective interpretations and rule against them. So, for example, gay marriage might be interpreted as okay now, but a couple of years later, it might be ruled as unconstitutional. Whereas if you had a constitutional amendment saying that people with the same sex marriage have rights, that's comparatively better on our side. Before I move on, yeah. If the constitution is conservative and society is conservative, your side changes nothing. At least we have the possibility to vary when society progresses, you still adhere to the constitutional constitution. Okay, here's the thing, right? If society is conservative, that's a perfectly legitimate viewpoint, and then that era can be conservative. But when they do shift to be liberal, they can implement those views into Congress as well. The next response we heard was that you get less, more acceptance of the constitution on their side. Unclear why, because the constitution is still the same original document. When we change that to a constitution that best suits liberal times, you get more acceptance to say that the constitution uh, serves them. Next, I want to talk about why legislation is, is structurally better. They need to stand for judicial interpretations that are tainted by judicial activism. But note that the law is permanent and you cannot go against it. So, when you look at issues like gay marriage, sure, they might have, sure, okay, there are a couple of things to say to this. Firstly, when you have a judicial decision, you take away all the political capital to push things through like legislation. So when the gay rights movement got a, a, a favorable interpretation for their side, they thought they already had a victory and didn't go for legislation. Why is this legislation better? So, as I've said before, you can always change your interpretation to say whether gay marriage is good or not. But on our side, the law will always be there. So even if you change interpretations, we have the law as well. Which is precisely the problem in the United States, where even though the Supreme Court ruled that gay marriage was constitutional and should be allowed, conservative states are able to say that there is no law against that, which is why they're still able to be discriminated against. The structural incentives as to why we're better on our side of the House. Note that constitutional amendments and laws exist permanently, which is why you cannot be tainted by judicial activism. What then have we told you? Firstly, we told you that law exists to be an objective institution and should not be tainted by personal biases because that's illegitimate. But secondly, alternatives are comparatively better by the slow, bureaucratic, biased, and undemocratic Supreme Court in the status quo. I'm proud to propose. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, welcome to the member of Thank you. 
So firstly, engaging with closed government. We finally get from, from this bench the explanation why on the comparative the legislation is not true. Because without that explanation, opening, uh, opening government's case doesn't apply because insofar as your, the legislation doesn't change and you don't have, uh, like you can uh, do the legislation in their case and you can do the legislation without the Supreme Court, there is no comparative change that we see. But what closing government today brings? They say, look, now you have this, uh, somehow there is less political capital to change anything because uh, uh, because now we just give this power to the judges uh, uh, and, uh, and they do the everything they say. We say that on the comparative, again, in the long term, there is no comparative change. Why? Firstly, it is because they can't pass the legislation that is going to be favorable, uh, uh, favorable to specific minorities. Why? Because, he's, uh, because, because there is a political polarization. There is the fact that in the Senate, it is uh, unlikely that you are going to receive certain problems, and there are, there are things like ideologies that make people decide irrationally. But secondly, even if you have the uh, uh, overturning of the gay marriage, we see that uh, uh, like uh, of the gay marriage ruling, and people actually uh, like. There is a precedent of, of, of the judges. It is still like, uh, like if you have an amendment, it is still very difficult to change it uh, for in that particular society, even through legislation. Yes, they say it is permanent and it is law, but it also is going to be permanent and it also is going to be law if you pass an amendment that says that gay marriage should be legal. So we don't say why are there structural reasons why the majority of people tend to be more progressive or tend to be less progressive. The only principal explanation is that people should consider consent to that. But insofar as they don't explain the principle of why the consent is should be the most important thing, their case falls apart and it doesn't really bring anything. Because we say that consent is not the most important thing in the democratic societies. Insofar as you have minorities that have small political political potential <coughs> to advance their, their rights, and they should be having rights. On the comparative constitutions, and you have the judges, constitutions tend to be made and they tend to focus specifically on individual rights that ensure that people who are, don't have power, who are not represented in the, uh, in, in the vast majority of cases, get reinterpreted in the way that is favorable to them. So on the comparative, these minority rights are the most important thing. They can't just say, well, look, this is a legitimate political position and that's why it's good. No, uh, insofar as you have a bigoted majority, we're very fine with protecting the rights of minorities on this side. Uh, uh, what we have from opening government is the fact that there is politi uh, politicization. We say, look, okay, let there be politicization insofar as the procedure doesn't change. We don't have to defend Mitch McConnell that, uh, uh, that destroys procedure in the U.S. Supreme Court. But insofar as you have rotation of Supreme Court judges, and they say, look, they have the incentives uh, uh, and they have the lobbyists who choose Point. them. Look, lobbyists don't choose Supreme Court ju judges insofar as what the opening government has said is true. They come from a limited number number of people who have, uh, who, like, to, from whom it is very hard to choose, and you can't choose the specific one that is going to protect certain, certain rights. So, uh, uh, and, and they have huge amounts of freedom to act after the fact that they have been chosen, because again, they don't what? care about what the president thinks. Okay. 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 If you say that consent is not important in a democracy, and you imply that liberalism is the best way to govern, what then would you support a dictator, a liberal dictator to rule the nation without the consent of the people? Uh, we would support the person who would support the rights of individual people. Yes, that's what we're going to stand for uh, in closing opposition. So look, firstly, there is no, never effective consent. You never can. So closing government comes out and says, look, you don't consent to judges. But you don't consent to anything, insofar as you are an individual person with the human experiences that you have. Consent doesn't exist in reality. It exists only insofar as people perceive that they're able to choose certain choices. But what is the most important thing is your ability to understand the law and get punished for that failure. Why? So we say that to the extent that you don't choose solely based on your decision, any senator, any president, we say what the most important thing should be is that you get what you expect in that particular situation. Because even if the law is unfair and you think that it is bad, we say that it is better for, for that law to be, like, it is. it, it will be uh, unlawful for you irrespective of your decision, but we say that it is better on our side of the house when people can understand it better. So why is that the most important thing in this debate? No. 
Look, we say that these uh, are not just about the cases of landmark decisions because they usually tend to be to have Senate majority. They usually uh, constitutional uh, Supreme Courts usually tend to prolong decisions, and they usually, uh, even if they do rule, they rule on some procedural issue that uh, no one really cares about. We think that it is mostly about people who live in, 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 in uh, who are in Guantanamo Bay and who believe that they can have ability to have like a writ of habeas corpus, but they realize that some three or four textualists some somehow think that, that it doesn't apply to them because the Guantanamo Bay is not on the US territory. So we think that this is about these individual cases of people who perceive the law to be uh, about a certain thing, but it turned out to be a different thing and we think that's horrible. So why do those things actually happen? Two, or two reasons for that. Firstly, it's because you have unintended consequences of any law that you pass. Second, you have changes in the way that, it, uh, that the law operates. Look, we say that this side can say you can change law at any particular moment in time. But the cases that we talk about, things like people in Guantanamo Bay, they don't get, get the political capital and the media attention necessary to change these issues in the first place. These are individual lives that have human experiences that can't be separated for the utilitarian good of the society. And we think that we have an ultimate duty to, uh, to make sure that these laws get interpreted in a good way. So what does that mean? What unintended consequences look like? We say that, for example, it is the, uh, the, the rule of the, uh, the, the law that ruled that, uh, uh, that the child can be separated for more than 20, uh, 20 days that had an unintended consequences of separating board, uh, families on the border. Issues like that might not have the ability to pass through the Senate but it means that at this particular moment in time, there might be separated yeah, families yeah. or there might be laws that are enforced. And we say that the most important thing is that people, before they do that, they can read and understand that the laws apply in these specific and unified ways. We think that people should not have the obligation and the duty to understand the nuances of each law so that, so, so that, that happens with the textualist approach. We think what, what happens uniquely when you interpret the Constitution in a specific way is that those those judges understand the original intent and they're able to sympathize and see that person suffering and that means for more just law, it means for better protection of rights. So I'm very proud of you. I think that's what you very much love to go quickly. Hi, judges, I'm going to talk about two things. Firstly, on the principle, and secondly, on change. But before I move on to those things, I'm going to first address some of the new material coming out of closing opposition. And I want to point out three things. The first thing that I do want to point out is the little bit of principle tension that comes between CEO and OO. That is to say, OO's justification for a lot of the things they wanted to do was the accountability towards the people. That is to say, their argumentation went along the lines that the Supreme Court should be able to rule in favor of the majoritarian people or the will of the people. So it becomes quite problematic when closing opposition then comes out and says, no, we just want the right decision to be made. And there's probably an inherent problem that's quite clear already there, right? Because the right decision decision is rarely very clear, and I'm going to show why that heavily impacts all of this new standard material they want to show to us. The second thing they brought to us was this idea of how minorities are never going to be represented in the change that is brought to you by a legislature. Three things on this. The first thing to say is that, yeah, they oftentimes are. Why? Because minorities oftentimes tend to be like swing voters, and they oftentimes tend to be quite a representative amount of the vote, right? That is to say, like, Democrats and Republicans in America both kind of want to at least cater towards one type of minority, because it tends to mean that they can win the majoritarian vote in, 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 in things like the Congress, right? So they often are represented in politics. But the second thing to note here is what the comparative is, right? Sure, legislature oftentimes takes a while to become accountable. The comparative on your side is waiting for five permanently intenured Supreme Court justices to die so they can be replaced one by one by people who are representative of your time. The important thing to note is the only form of accountability on your side is hoping that the permanently account appointed judge from like maybe two or three terms back is the one that is accurate enough to represent the newly developed changes in morals as OO wants to talk about. But the third thing here is that like they didn't really engage on the principle, and I'll talk more about why the assent actually matters when I talk about the principle here. The third thing to say is at the end of their speech, they talked about why case-by-case -case specificity can oftentimes be good, examples being for Guantanamo Bay. But that is uh, unfortunately still relying on the link that the judges are actually able to make accurate or representative decisions. I'm going to argue why that's not true in the pragmatics. Firstly then, on the principle. Before that, sure. 
Yeah, I'm not sure that there's a principal violation of the mandate of judges on our side because the principle, because the mandate of the judges could be to interpret the constitution in an originalist manner, but it could also be to interpret the constitution as a living and breathing document. It really depends on the outcome of this debate. And right. I want to, right. 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 yeah, yeah, but the mandate of the people is definitely not the, what the majority doesn't want, right? And that's what they were arguing for, the fact that sometimes there can be a right decision that should be able to override majorities. So the tension is probably still there, right? So then on to the principle. When it explains to you why these structures are inherently undemocratic, that is to say that they're unaccountable to the people because they're not voted in in any way other than being appointed by the president, it's also quite arbitrary when these people decide to die or retire. This is also at the same time arbitrary when they get picked. So what type of decision making they have and what opinions they have, all completely arbitrary. None of it is basically decided by the people. Closing opposition's response to this was that, you know, consent doesn't matter and sometimes it doesn't exist. Firstly, on whether or not it matters. Obviously, consent does matter, and that's probably something the other three houses largely did agree with. Why? Because the government's mandate or ability to create law is largely dependent upon the people. That is to say, they're largely pretty much ineffectual in that the government has no legitimacy whatsoever if they literally never represent any of the people whatsoever. So consent oftentimes quite uh, principally does matter when it comes to the ability to create legislation that is supposed to rule the people that give you the legitimacy to rule them in the first place. But the second thing here is like this quite abstract notion that you know not everything is consensual because you can never make a purely consensual decision. Well, sure, on our side, not everything is 100% consensual. On your side, there's 0% consensual. We would prefer the ability for you to vote because that's a little bit closer to the consent that we think people principally deserve. That is why we took that clash. Lastly, then, on the pragmatics, the brunt of opening debate and probably what they might want to talk about in closing, too, right? We told you there's three things here. The first thing here is on the effectiveness, uh, is on the legitimacy of these policies. That is to say, Lyndon explained to you why the Supreme Court's decisions oftentimes tend to be illegitimate for a variety of reasons. The first reason was that they were quite unaccountable. Now, opening opposition's claim here is that you know there's lobbying, so politicians are unaccountable as well. But then it really comes down to the comparative, right? On our side, you are accountable to the lobbyists, but at the same time, you're also accountable to the voters because you do need to get reelected as a legislator or a politician. On your side, you're appointed by someone who was also lobbied, like presidents tend to oftentimes be quite lobbied, right? So you already are entering this with necessarily a certain amount of bias, but at the same time, you're also permanent and completely random. So at the, when you think on a comparative, you're probably a little bit more accountable on our side. The second reason why you tend not to have legitimacy is the Supreme Court, just on a perception basis, oftentimes is seen as bad when they decide to pass policies. That's to say, judicial activism doesn't have really have a great reputation when it decides to act against the people's will. That's to say, you don't have any sort of legitimacy to pass policy or make interpretations that are supposed to be regarded as law, because that was not your function in a check and balance system. People tend to be like, why is my government doing things from the judiciary branch, things that are supposed to be done in the legislative branch? But the third thing that he told you was there's oftentimes also a lack of consensus. That is to say, the Supreme Court is built in a way that it's never really repre represented by the people, and it oftentimes is unable to find consensus because it's solely decided based off of which president was around when the, pe when the previous judges decided <coughs> to retire. The impact of this then was that oftentimes people don't actually fully believe in the policies that are passed through the Supreme Court's interpretation. That is why like in the example of gay marriage, whilst gay marriage was proved to be accepted in that instance, because it wasn't passed in law, conservative areas still are able to defect back to their own interpretations, which is oftentimes why things like this, policies like this, are oftentimes ineffectual and actually creating proper change because of the lack of legitimacy. The second thing we wanted to talk about was like the speed at which things were uh, putting through, and all had a common misconception that legislation was slower than the Supreme Court. But that's oftentimes just a misconception because so, uh, like legislation tends to be live streamed Supreme Court decisions. Uh, the important thing here is that legislation, yes, is slow. What is slower is the process in which you have to pick a perfect case. You have to be selected by the Supreme Court, and you have to have the right judges in turn to make the decision that you want. That's why Brown v. Board took the lawyer who passed it 40 years to be able to find the right case and the right opportunity to pass it. Importantly, this means you don't actually get the same amount of representation that they want to characterize. The last thing here then was on permanency. We told you that because the Supreme Court was on a case-by-case -case basis, and oftentimes they knew that they shouldn't be passing laws, so they made their interpretations very specific, and then that oftentimes it wouldn't be applicable to all circumstances. And this is quite problematic, right? Because when in specific cases you are able to win, oftentimes the people who are activists that are trying to create change become satiated by the fact that they have won one Supreme Court ruling, regardless of whether or not that is effective in creating the change that they needed to change. Ultimately, to stay on the right side of the, uh, 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 the right side of history, you probably needed to stay on the side that was with the people's mandate. We were very proud to propose. Uh, I think that's a good right motion.
stuff was the opera. actual representation there. But we believe that we need to be a bit comparative here because at the time the constitution was created and the original intent of, of the people who put it was written by slave owners who weren't inclusive at all uh, at that period of time. So why courts are far more better? Because first of all we believe that the extent of knowledge and education is higher on our side of the house because these co uh, these courts like uh, taught the costs and benefits to different parts of population because that's what in the edu educated system why the, those, those slave owners themselves were, for instance, exploiting the labor uh, of other countries. But second of all, we, we believe that the courts need to be progressive in order to advance in the career, for instance, to, they, they also care for their public image, but also to gain good communications with other people. But third of all, we believe that the courts also somehow representative in the status quo because if we believe, we accept that the situation, the general situation isn't perfect, but there is the where some woman and there is a black person now, uh, while the, actually the original creators were the wealthiest while white men with a huge power. So we believe that the original motivation of the law is important because if it was aimed to, for instance, equalize the opportunities between the majority and the minority, but due to the original intent, if it backfires, we believe it's unjust as open opposition claimed it's for society, but in closing up opposition we believe that, especially in the case of individuals who have no other means to change that situation. Furthermore, open government here told you that, but the law will only favor the majority. Firstly, here I'll share, my partner told you that individual cases should be judged individually, looking at the best, uh, at all the qualities uh, that are highly subjective and it will only be on our side of the house. Here is proven that that's, that's all also applicable for the minorities. But second of all, we believe that the law process doesn't work in that way. There would be uh, an active discussion within the Supreme Court about how it affects the different a bit later, how it affects the different aspects and parts of the society. But third of all, we believe that closing the logic of the closing government also works here because now parties who elect those Supreme Courts also will have an incentive to get the votes from these minorities through actually promising ju fair judge and good legislature in order to advance them and their rights. So we believe that the right to just treatment, the point my, my partner brought you is an important one because people should actually feel that the individual respect that the state uh, should impose. Importantly, we believe that that responsibility especially lies on the state, which is created on the purpose of uh, treating uh, treating every citizen equally and providing uh, for more fair decisions for any person. So, second of all, why uh, individual cases matter a lot? So, those government here talked a little bit about less political capital to change something, but we believe that we've already answered a lot. My partner told you about political polarization and ideology Point. problems that exist in those structures, and we get no response from them. But the government here talked about the consent, but we believe that it's not the most important thing here if that consent actually uh, if that consent actually harms the rights of the other person, that's a basic harm principle that we always, as a state, prioritize. The response was that the government told you that all oh, consent principle matters because that's the person's and society's choice. But who always do, uh, but who always does not prioritize consent and choice in every circumstance. For instance, people don't choose and consent for the election of the same judges in the Supreme Court. We <coughs> need all those choices to choose yes. the fair and right. more better outcomes, and that's why this point also doesn't work. Especially in law, we believe that we aim to 
more favorite treatment because that is the main principle of the law in and of itself, but also that, that was the sole purpose for which the law was created to, uh, to treat every person equally. So uh, my partner already talked to you how it, uh, these kind of situations affect individual cases, and he talked about Guantanamo Bay people, but it also affects minorities like uh, as, as, like children se separated from their mothers in their bodies. We believe that as a state we owe a special obligation to these people because there is a disproportionate harm and suffering on their side, but also there are no other alternatives like they can't access media in order to advance their rights uh, themselves. So we achieve, uh, we achieve more just law and decisions when the judge will be able to realize the intent of the, intent of the law in the first place, and to sympathize and understand the whole situation regarding the personal case. But closing up, I told you that minorities and party incentives exist, but, but we, we believe that, for instance, African Americans are excluded generally from this discussion because they either don't vote at all or, or vote or purely for Democrats uh, on, on uh, most of the circumstances. So what we achieve is much more just personal uh, Cases and that how your rights more. Okay. The problem is that oftentimes these case by case basis take up the political capital or satiate the activists that would otherwise be able to ask for legislative that can be brought up to help more than just one okay. case. Madam Speaker, we already tried the decent reasons for why the alternative won't work, and I have uh, we believe that's sufficient. So why the material provided by our servant has is more important than the most material. Because we believe that we have to make a the greater analysis to, uh, in order to prove how we believe the Supreme Court is organized and how the change actually comes. Because the precise reasons opening opposition talked about also partly works against their case. For instance, uh, for instance, sometimes courts are also affected to lobbies and all those kind of things. Furthermore, in the history of time frames, despite the reasons provided by the law, they were actually successful amendments passed. We believe that that happens on both sides of the house. But my partner uniquely told me that the individual cases are more important because there are no other alternatives to achieve that outcome rather than this because the impact of those structures will never change on their side of the house and we believe that that's why it matters. Uh, we are very proud of this. Thanks very much. We're going to step back and call you back in the next uh, uh, Very complex topic, but I think lends itself to what seemed like a, a messy debate at times. Um, what I'm going to do is, is give a call a little bit to like, more or less chronologically explain why that happened. I'm going to do a couple of points uh, of general, and I'll turn it over to, to Dan and to some general as well. So the Abbey the first to close the government and the second to open opposition, the third to open the government, and the fourth, unfortunately, to see it. And um, so let's go through what, what, what happened in this space. I think OG set up a, a very reasonable case, which is essentially about the character of, of judges, um, and given the system of appointment of judges to Supreme Courts, why you are likely to get uh, certain people entrenched in political views making that decision. And given that comparative, it is preferable to have a standard that is so way objective, that is, that is, that is so <coughs> much um, anchored to some standard that people can identify, because otherwise we just end up in a situation where individual judges are making individual decisions. In terms of or individual decisions based on their own biases, in terms of the interaction with, with OO here, I think OO have a number of very plausible um, responses to the idea that judicial biases are, are, are likely to cause issues. Um, in particular, though, a lot of this comes down to what OG thinks happens next, which is that once those historical biases are, uh, are opened up for everyone to view, you can then push for things like amendment and for re-legislation. I think OO tackled this quite well in terms of giving us a number of structural reasons why things like amendment um, and legislative change are extremely difficult, namely that, that lobbyists are involved on the political level, that it's an exceptionally lengthy process, that party politics become embroiled in what would otherwise just be a judicial decision, which then gives us a, a, a number of reasons to question the extent to which we will actually achieve change. And the problem with that is that we also think OO have laid out quite reasonably that the kind of laws that we're talking about are texts that say more or less things like that, that same-sex marriage is restricted, or rather that marriage is restricted to opposite-sex couples, um, etc. Uh, and we think that, that in the top half, assuming that what we would like is, 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 is rights for all, it becomes a problem. 
pro G. We will say here, though, this becomes a problem in the short diagram, which I'll move to now. There is an assumption in OO that you are likely to get decisions that are more liberal uh, or, or, or more progressive. I think that is something that needed more work. In particular, though, one of the good responses that CG gave to this, and we'll move into the CG case now, is the fact that even if you get your best case scenario and you get a nice result that, that gives rights to people, there's really no concreteness to that decision, and it's entirely possible that it's rolled back in six years' time, and you get a conservative justice uh, on, on the court or a conservative majority, and that lends an arbitrariness to the extent to which people get rights that is uh, suboptimal. In particular, then, CG also gave a comparative whereby without those decisions, it would be more likely that you would get legislation addressing those issues because the problem is that having a decision made in the Supreme Court saps political will to push for that change in the legislature or by amendment instead. I think that's perfectly plausible. Um, we, we, we do think we have questions about, these, the, about, about how it is that that genesis comes about instead, like how it is that political will becomes mobilized. We think that it's both plausible that you can have rollbacks and then that it's quite difficult to push for change on that basis. So that goes some way towards explaining the short diagonal class here, which is that we essentially need to believe that on net we are getting more benefits from the judges that we're talking about on these laws, when in reality we have every reason to believe that these are extremely arbitrary, that you're waiting for people to die, to be replaced and so on, you get drawn out um, conditions whereby the, the laws in question are extremely problematic. In terms of the, the, the back half cash then, uh, we think CO uh, advancing a number of claims that uh, engage with both OO and, and CG and so and so G to, to different degrees. So the first of these claims is that um, that essentially that, that what's really important to terms of justice is ensuring that individuals get their justice and that one would be always be palatable to the majority and the reason that Supreme Courts are, are important in terms of making those decisions is that they will arrive at decisions <coughs> that may favour those minorities. So a couple of things is we're, we're not entirely sure at any point in their case why it is likely that, that, that your Supreme Court judges are more likely to give those beneficial results than any of the comparisons in the debate, whether it's OO's justices and in particular the political processes that the entirety of the prop bench have pursued. In particular, though, the parts of the analysis is contingent on this question of whether or not the consent of the governed is ultimately what matters. And we are given plausible enough reasons back from CG about why it is that government has to be based on consent or some degree of consent, or at a very minimum, that some modicum of consent is better than absolutely none. So again, that's something that needed quite a bit more buttressing in order for that to be light in the debate. To a certain extent, though, we do think quite a lot of those claims either seem that they're not directly connected to the question of whether or not Supreme Court judges are interpreting a documents using original methods or living document methods or whatever it is. There's also come some, some way to, to explain the long diagonal in the sense that while we think a lot of the material from OG has been very successfully litigated by OO, we do believe their claim that some standard is preferable to presumably no standard. And given that your claim is that individual judges are better placed to make decisions for minorities, which we're not sure is A, true, or B, likely to happen, that's a reason to prefer their standard to potentially no standard. Um, one of the reasons this debate is so complex, as you've probably seen, is that you're almost all operating on a different set of comparatives from one another, which at times intersect, and at many times do not intersect, and certainly when they do intersect, you're not always flagging the ways in which they interact with one another. What I would say is that I think in certain respects this debate maybe suffered from the fact that it became quite US-centric, in the sense that while the US Supreme Court is an example that many of you are quite familiar with, it also has very particular um, like structures that aren't common to all Supreme Courts, and in particular the US political system, might not be the easiest one to make cases in relation to because many of their problems would be worse or many of their advantages would be better or whatever. That's what I thought I had about why this today maybe ended up as complex as it was. The only other thing I would um, say is that and this is feedback I've given to some of you before in other rounds. One of the other big problems in this debate is that many of you are positing outcomes without giving me the likelihood that that outcome will, will result. So we have claims, for example, that you will get more liberal, or that there's a possibility of getting more liberal decisions, that there's a possibility of getting far more conservative decisions. That is extremely difficult to adjudicate. In reality, what we need is some idea of how likely or how probable those outcomes are in order to weigh them against one another because otherwise it's left ultimately to the whims of your judges, which is not a situation you want to be in. What? 
Yeah, so to follow up on that, I think this is a very interesting motion in the sense that I think that one of the big things you have to ask in this is that the motion posits a very problematic policy and idea. And it's a very easy thing, and it almost begs opening opposition to explain all the problems with this idea. The problem with this round, though, is that ultimately there needs to be some sort of comparative and alternative because it's an idea that needs one. And this is precisely what, I felt hap what we felt happened at the top half, which is open <coughs> government's actual argument here is that you need a standard. We think that the standard for all its flaws is better. The response we get, and they give us some re from here, is a long list of flaws and lots of reasons why this is bad. And in fact, I think some of the best arguments in this round, the best made stuff, comes from opening opposition explaining why this is bad standard. Where the greatest weakness comes up, and this is really a problem that the entire op bench never really answers, is even if we buy all of these things, what is the alternative standard? In top half, we have almost attention because the standard is justice. We want something that people believe to be just outcomes. But by very definition, if an outcome is populist, but justice is for minorities, those things may be in tension. And furthermore, and secondly on this, almost all the examples we're getting in terms of progressive stuff is dependent on a degree of certainty as to what those outcomes will be. And I think in a lot of ways, the damage that CG does when they say it's entirely random who gets to replace it because we have, we, have, we have lifetime time, which means when people die is random. Some presidents get no appointments. Some get a lot. Donald Trump's going to get two in two years. Jimmy Carter got zero in four years. Like, a lot of this is random. And the point at which judicial activism, that then, like, if the alternative to basically a fixed standard, even an imperfect one, is judicial activism, what they're saying is your obligation is to defend, either defend both conservative and liberal judicial activism, or explain why you're generally going to get liberal judicial activism rather than it. And I think in the absence of either of those, everything you say can basically be accepted by us as being true, but we can still ultimately say that if they can make a case for why the alternative is worse, then the stuff there about the standard still exists. And that's basically the thing they provide, is reasons why everything else has the potential to lead to worse outcomes on those metrics. And I, I, or, and I mean, I think that this is, I think that this is a challenging motion for that reason because I think all of your instincts are to say what's wrong with originalism, but not necessarily what is what is right with the courts. Why do we want the courts? What do we want them to do in this debate? Because if you don't have a positive alternative on what you want to have happen, it's very hard to weigh all of the very well analyzed material. And I want to, I don't think the depth of analysis was a problem in this debate. It was the lack of a comparative to explain why that very deep and very effective analysis actually mattered and placed you above teams and was a reason to do things. Um, I think we should never be head back. What you should approach social security would be back.